so I will speak about uh, now about hemodynamic monitoring in septic shock. And the question is how to choose. Again, my conflicts of interest. As you know, in uh, shock patients, there are various uh, intricate mechanisms responsible for the hemodynamic failure. Hypovolemia, vasculotum depression, myocardial depression. And for these mechanisms, we have treatments, fluids, vasopressors, inotropes. And you will understand that in many shock states, that there is a combination of mechanisms. And sometimes it is difficult to know which is the most important. And it is important to assess the degree of each component to select the most appropriate treatment. And also, this is our job as, as intensivists, is to assess the response to the treatment. Another element which is important in the choice of hemodynamic monitoring is the presence of associated ARDS. As you know, now we have many hemodynamic monitoring devices. Many invasive, less invasive, minimally invasive, non-invasive. Many devices, an abundant, an abundant literature about their validity, many papers every day are published about the validity of uh, these devices, but still a dilemma as to which ones to use and at what point. We have many variables now, many variables. It is like a puzzle. It could be complicated. So I will try to give you my opinion, not only my opinion, but also the opinion of the European Society of Intensive Medicine from two papers. One is a consensus conference paper published uh, in 2014, and the other one was a paper coming from the cardiovascular section of the European Society of Intensive Medicine about how to choose the hemodynamic monitoring. And I will start from this paper I had the privilege to conduct. And we started from the point that if you have a patient with shock, of course, you have to identify shock. But when you identify shock, you have five things to do at the same time. At the same time, five things to do. It's good because we have five hands, so we do five things. First is clinical assessment. Of course, it is important at the beginning of the story of shock to well examine the patient. Uh, we know that clinical assessment is important. This is a recent paper uh, coming from uh, Latin America, the Andromeda Shock Study conducted by Glenn Hernandez from Chile and others. And I participated in this paper. And this, in this paper, uh, we compared two strategies. One strategy was guided by lactate, as recommended by the surviving sepsis campaign. And the other strategy was guided by capillary field time, very simple. A clinical marker of uh, skin perfusion. There was no difference between these two strategies in terms of primary outcome, which was mortality, but almost a difference. The p-value was 0 0.06, which is almost significant, but it was not, in favor of CRT uh, guidance. But this paper emphasizes on the importance of clinical examination. Another paper also emphasized on the importance of uh, skin perfusion markers. It also was published this year in 2019 in ICM. And this paper looked at skin 
perfusion markers like Motling or capillary field time, CRT, to assess a low cardiac output, to predict a low cardiac output in patients with shock. And they found that the sensitivity was not good, but the specificity was good, meaning that if you have a prolonged CRT or the presence of mottling, this indicates that cardiac output is low. And this is not sensitive, but it is very specific. So you don't need to measure cardiac output if you have this kind of signs at the bedside. It can help, of course, for the decision to give fluids, for example. Lactate also is important, not only for, for the baseline value, but for the change over time. Echocardiography is important because it can provide many variables which are important to assess the cardiac function, the right as well as the left ventricle function. And also, central venous catheter is recommended to be inserted in patients with shock. And in addition to fluid infusion or uh, drugs infusion, it can also provide some important variables in terms of hemodynamics, CVP, SCVU2, and PCVCU2. CVP is helpful to diagnose RV dysfunction. When you have a high CVP, you can diagnose, you can detect RV dysfunction, you can confirm by echocardiography, of course. It also, it is also important to target the optimal mean arterial pressure. Why? Because as you know, mean arterial pressure is the upstream pressure for organ perfusion, brain, kidney, etc. But there is a downstream pressure. Normally, the downstream pressure is negligible compared to the upstream pressure. But in some cases of high CVP, for example, probably the downstream pressure is high. And you have to take into account this downstream pressure when you target your MAP. And this uh, was well illustrated by this paper coming from UK and Marlis Osterman as the first author. And they showed that the mean perfusion pressure, that is to say the difference between MAP and CVP, but not MAP was an independent factor associated with the progression of acute kidney injury. And they found that a value of 60 meters of mercury for the difference, uh, they found this as a cutoff. So normally you should have a higher value than 60 to have a good perfusion of the kidney. So take into account CVP. Essentially, when you have a high CVP, you have to, to subtract this for MAP, and you can uh, target MAP using CVP. But as we said before, it is not helpful to predict full responsiveness. I will skip this slide because I already showed this. SCV2 also is important. As you know, SV2, mixed venous blood, uh, equals SAO2 minus the ratio of oxygen consumption VU2 divided by cardiac output times hemoglobin concentration times 13.4. And because many papers show that SCVU2 is an acceptable reflection of SVU2, we can consider SCVU2 as an acceptable indicator of VU2 due to balance. And you know, that SCVU2 was proposed as an endpoint in the early go director therapy protocol proposed by Rivers and co workers years ago. And you remember that SCVU2 was the endpoint, the main endpoint in the early phase of resuscitation in the early go director therapy group compared to the control group. And you remember that the early go director therapy group had a better outcome in terms of mortality and morbidity than the control group. And this is why for years, for years, the surviving sepsis campaign recommended to use SCV2 for the, for guiding, fluid, uh, not fluid, but resuscitation 
in the early phase of severe sepsis and septic shock. But you also know that this disappeared recently in the last version of the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines do not recommend to measure SCVU2, and there is no mention to SCVU2 anywhere in the 93 recommendations of this last version of the guidelines. Why? Probably because of the pr publication of three important multicenter randomized controlled trials comparing the early goal directed therapy to standard care and they used SCVU2 in the early goal directed therapy and there was no difference between standard care in these three multicenter randomized controlled trials. This is probably why the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines deleted SCVU2 from the recommendations. But now we have to be very cautious about this because patients were far less sick than in the reverse study. And their mean SCVU2 was already more than 70% the target at the inclusion time because they received a lot of fluids before the inclusion time. And therefore, by design, this study could not show any benefit of targeting SCVU2 above 70% because it was already above 70%. And this study cannot tell you, cannot tell us, about the utility of targeting or not SCVU2 above 70% in patients with low SCVU2. We don't know because it is not in the study. This is why still the European Society of Industrial Medicine recommends to use SCVU2 for helping uh, intensivists for, uh, to guide therapy. And in this paper, published more recently, after the publication of these three important multicenter randomized controlled trials, we still recommend to measure SCV2, and we said when you have a low SCV2, it indicates insufficient global oxygen delivery, and this could, this could incite uh, to increase oxygen delivery. PCVCU2. PCVCU2 is also recommended by the, society, the European Society of Industrial Medicine, this consensus conference report. And in this uh, paper, coming from the same society, we say that PCU2 gap, the difference between the atoll PCU2 and the central venous PCU2, could be helpful when SCV2 is within the, within the normal range because of alteration of oxygen extraction capacities. And in this case, the high SPCU2 gap, more than six millimeters of mercury, suggests that calic output should be elevated to improve tissue oxygenation. In fact, PCU2 gap is considered a marker of the adequacy of the venous blood flow to clear the CO2 produced at the peripheral, in the peripheral tissues. So a normal delta PCU2 suggests that elevation of calacabut cannot be a priority in the therapeutic strategy. A high delta PCU2 suggests that elevation of cardiac output can be a good therapeutic option. This is very simple to do. You can do this for every patient with shock. It does not require any sophisticated device. We also recommended to insert an atoll catheter and, of course, it can provide the atoll pressure curve with a systolic atoll pressure, which is a good reflection of the left ventricular afterload. The mean atoll pressure, which is an important target for resuscitation of patients with shock. But don't forget to subtract CVP. The diastolic atoll pressure, which is a good reflection of the vasomotor tone, 
and a low DAP is mainly due to depressed atoll tone. So it is very easy to detect vasoplegic shock and to decide to give a vasopressor. Pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and the diastolic pressure. And pulse pressure, sorry, when a low pulse pressure, for example, 30 meters of mercury, suggests that the stroke volume is low because pulse pressure is directly related to stroke volume. So you have a lot of information, but also you can use the shape of the atoll pressure curve and to analyze its shape. As I said before in my previous talk, we can look at the variation during mechanical ventilation of pulse pressure, pulse pressure variation. When you have a high PPV, it is associated with pulse responsiveness, a low PPV associated with pulse unresponsiveness. And as I said before, it is a good marker of field responsiveness in septic shock patients, but there are a lot of uh, uh, limitations in ICU patients. One of them is tidal volume, low tidal volume, and I propose to you to use a tidal volume challenge. An increase in pulse pressure variation during a tidal volume challenge can help you to uh, predict fluid responsiveness. This needs further confirmation again. So, at that point, you have a lot of information. Clinical assessment, lactate, echocardiography as soon as possible, plus CVP, plus SCV2, plus PC2 gap, plus atoll pressure and the atoll pressure waveform. It is a lot of information. You can make a decision. If there is no associated ARDS, you can make a decision. And you can propose a treatment. If the patient responds positively to this initial treatment, okay, you can continue with the same hemodynamic monitoring, very simple monitoring, basic monitoring, and until shock resolution. If the patient does not respond positively to the treatment you initially proposed, you have to go to more advanced hemodynamic monitoring technologies. For example, transparent thermal dilution systems or pulmonary artery catheter, and this is especially in case of RV dysfunction detected by echocardiography. If you have an associated severe ARDS initially, it is more complicated. It is a complex situation, and you need, and we propose this uh, a, uh, panel of experts from the ESICM propose to go directly to advanced hemodynamic motoring technologies. What about transparent thermal dilution? You know, the system is, this is a system which is connected to the patient through two catheters, central venous catheter for cold bolus injection and thermal dilution, thermal atoll catheter for recording the changes in blood temperature induced by the cold bolus injection and also to monitor blood pressure. These systems can provide color output using two different techniques. The first one is thermodilution, intermittent cardiac output. The second one is pulse control analysis, continuous and real-time cardiac output. But the interest of this technique is, is, is not only to measure cardiac output, is, it is also to provide other important variables. For example, the system provides global and diastolic volume, which is a measure of global cardiac preload. It also provides CFI and GF. CFI is cardiac function index. GF is global ejection fraction, which are good markers of global systolic function. It also provides extra vascular lung water, which, pro which is a quantitative measure of pulmonary edema. And in many 
many situations, critical patients in general, but also septic patients, septic shock patients, ARDS patients, this uh, variable extra water was demonstrated to be associated with mortality independently on other variables. It also provides pulmonary vascular pump mobility index, PVPI, which is a good measure of lung capillary, capillary leak permeability, if you want. And it can well, it can help to well distinguish between ARDS and hydrostatic pulmonary edema. In this study we did uh, in the past, years ago now, we use this index and we could well distinguish between ARDS and cardiogenic pulmonary edema and we found a cutoff value of three with a good sensitivity and specificity and it was confirmed by other studies. And in this study, in ARDS patients, we found that this marker, PVPI, pulmonary vascular permeability index, it was an independent predictor of mortality in ARDS patients. Also, these systems can provide continuous scalar car output using the pulse control analysis and can be very helpful to perform diagnostic and therapeutic tests like passive leg raising, for example, free challenge, etc. And finally, these systems provide SVV and PPV for guiding fluid administration. And therefore, they are very useful for guiding fluid management, especially in patients with both shock and ARDS, because they can help you to well assess the fluid infusion benefit risk ratio. The benefit, the numerator of the ratio, can be, can be assessed by PPV, pulse pressure variation, or stroke volume variation, and the risk can be assessed by extravasal water and PVPI. And this can help you to make the decision to start, to continue, or to stop with infusion. What to do when pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation are not interpretable for many reasons? We can use passive leg raising. I don't want to, to go into details because I already presented this. So PLR can replace PPV to assess the numerator of the benefit risk ratio and therefore it is very simple to make the decision of fluid infusion, fluid continuation, or fluid interruption. PA carcitor also can be recommended as an advanced monitoring technology, and this especially in case of RV dysfunction because it can provide important variables like right atrial pressure, pulmonary artery pressure, calculated pulmonary vascular resistance, etc. What about the other techniques? In the ICU patients, in shock patients, these techniques are not recommended. And in general, we said that these techniques can be recommended, may be recommended in uh, the operating room settings, but not in the ICU settings. I want to finish my presentation by giving you an example of a resuscitation of a patient with septic shock. A patient presenting with septic shock, we propose to infuse around 10 ml per kilogram of crystalloids within the first hour could be 45 minutes, 60 minutes, but it is not a fixed volume or infusion rate. This can be higher. You can increase the rate of infusion if you have fluid losses, if you have abdominal sepsis, which is in general associated with a more profound hypovolemia, if you have a mottling, 
increase capillary field time if you have a low pulse pressure, meaning a low stroke volume. On the other hand, you can decrease the infusion rate if you have a worsening of uh, tachypnea or a fall in oxygen saturation during your fluid infusion. So it is important to individualize fluid therapy even at the initial phase of uh, resuscitation. Don't forget to give norepinephrine if you have a low diastolic at all pressure, and this independently of uh, a fluid, of uh, fluid optimization. So what to do after? You can ask the question, does shock persist? And you have to rely on clinical signs, lactate, etc. If yes, if shock persists, try to optimize the macro circulation first. You have to do two things at the same time. You check if MAP is adequate and you check if oxygen delivery is adequate to oxygen consumption. Check if MAP is adequate means in fact check if MAP minus CVP is adequate. As I said before, if yes, okay. If no, look at the diastolic atoll pressure. If the diastolic atoll pressure is low, consider the use of vasopressors. If it is not low, it is probably due to insufficient calic output. But at the same time, measure SCV2. It is a strong recommendation, not only from me, but for many others. We have two possibilities now. We have a low, normal, or high SCV2. Low means less than 70%. In this case, it is important to try to increase oxygen delivery in, the, in this situation of shock. And for this, we have first to look at hemoglobin concentration. Of course, if SCV2 is low and hemoglobin concentration is low, you have to consider blood transfusion. If not, it is probably due to insufficient calic output. So two possibilities, insufficient contractility, or insufficient preload. Insufficient contractility, you have to look at the left and right ventricular functions using echocardiography. If you have impaired left or right ventricular function, you have to consider the use of inotropes. If not, it is a problem of insufficient preload. For this, the question is, should we infuse Fluids. Again, use preload variables, dynamic variables to assess fluid responsiveness. This is a numerator of the benefit risk ratio of fluid infusion. And the denominator, in case of ARDS especially, look at either POP if you use a PA capacitor or extra strong water if you use the transmitter thermal dilution systems as safety parameters. And you can assess easily the benefit risk ratio of fluid infusion. And you can make the decision to give fluids or not. What about normal SCV2 meaning between 70 and 78%, for example? Look at PCU2 gap. If you have a high PCU2 gap, a normal PCU2 gap, more than six meters of mercury, it means that calic output is not sufficient. So you have to do exactly the same reasoning. Sorry. Exactly the same reasoning as before. If PCU2 gap is high. If PC2 gap is not high, it's not a good news because it means that you cannot do anything with the traditional treatments, fluids, inotropes, and vasopressors. Nothing to do. This is the same situation as if you have a high SCV2. You can, you can do nothing in terms of macrocirculation. 
You are just you have just to pray if you are a believer to pray, or to wait for the action of antibiotics or the source control. Now, this puzzle is almost reconstructed. There is always a missing link, but missing piece. But this is light. This is the light of intensity. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias.